Hey, welcome to Iron Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. We're we're snowing. It is right snowing. Now. It's snowing right now. I think it's actually turning into rain, so that's unfortunate. Mm. Snow's always better. It's like a little winter wonderland. Well, it's I like I like snow because if you're fast enough, you can dodge it. No, James. You can yeah. <laughs> You I can't got, dodge. Snow. I got those quick northeastern. Listen, I grew up in the northeast. I don't know if you have to deal with this in North Carolina, it, but in North Carolina, we ran into the snow. If it started snowing, we'd all just like go outside and try to get as much <laughs> snow as we could. No way, man. We us PA PA kids, Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, we dodged the snow. We learned to dodge it. That's we that's came to school extra dry. <laughs> How's your week been, man? Not too bad. Just chilling. Just chilling. Yeah. Just working. Yeah, doing some yeah, doing some work. You know, you watch me. Same, same. You see me working. I, I, that's all I actually do is I just sit there and watch James work. I don't actually do any work. I just yeah. watch him. Work. It's amazing that Nick hasn't gotten fired. <laughs> oh man, but uh, yeah, we've been we've been uh just working. Um, I'm trying to think of some like small weekly updates. The Discord's been going well. Yes. Um, we're actually. I, we're actually live on the discord right now we are live on the discord we just turn our mics on we let we said hey we're live if you guys want to listen listen to it live so i mean if you guys catch us at the right time you know yeah next week try it out these are those discord perks yeah so yeah if you guys aren't in the discord it's essentially a chat room kind of like slack if you're familiar with that or not Mm -hmm. but um you know we talk about design and i don't know it's like it's really fun. It's like the thing that we've been looking for. Yeah. Do we want to talk about how unnecessary the uh, Slack redesign, logo redesign was? I mean, that's kind of out of our purview. It's graphic design. But so... Uh, you want to talk about it? Okay. Well, I mean, only slightly. <laughs> we can we can just touch on it for a second, but I just didn't feel like they needed a redesign. I mean, I think there were some smart things done with the redesign, one of which was that the the old logo had something like 16 colors mm. in it, and yeah, the yeah. new logo has, has four, and it's kind of separated out. But, you know, they got Pentagram involved. Right, yeah. So, and, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Slack, Slack's essentially the workplace chat room kind of way, yeah. kind of thing. Like... You know, instead of emailing each other, people can just Slack each other. Oh, I love Slack. You it's can, really nice. It's, you can it's drop great files in there. You know, mm-hmm. you can call out everybody. And uh, Pentagram redesigned their logo recently. Yeah, was, I think it was Michael Beirut. It was like last month or so. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a clean logo, but I was like, this company has barely been out for a second. I, and they're going to Pentagram? I, I will say that I think logo redesigns always get a bit of criticism. Absolutely. But... But I, I personally think that the Slack logo redesign is, like, fine. Like, I don't think it's, like, a bad redesign. I think it's an improvement because, like you mentioned, the original Slack logo had 16 colors in it, which right. is uh, obscene to, like, try to print on a T-shirt. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> try to embroider 16 colors. Right. I just, for me, it was it was that moment of just, wait, what? I, you know, I'd come to know this this program, and I never was like, "Oh my God, they really need a a refresh." And it didn't even seem like that big of a refresh. Yeah, it's a very young company for a refresh, I think. Yeah, but but anyway, that's that, startup lifestyle. You that's know? just my my little mini rant. Um, but I kind of wanted to pop off on some other comments that we had in Discord. Pop off on it, Nick. <laughs> um, well, actually, I, you know, last week we talked about design trends. Uh, specifically, we talked about the speckled CMF oh, trend. Oh yeah! And your your dad, well, actually, your dad was on the Discord, but your dad had a comment on the YouTube. My dad weighed in. Now, if you don't, if you aren't familiar with Peter Connors, it's because you don't own a roto molding factory. Yes, James's or, dad has a roto molding or factory. work within the material handling realm. But yeah, my dad um, is the founder CEO of uh, Remcon Plastics. And they do rotationally molded items such as uh, road barriers. Mm-hmm. Um, they've done playground equipment. They've done... Bins. Bins. Lots which, of bins. Which you've designed I've some. I've designed some. And we've talked about it. Episode 10, I think. 10? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just throwing it out. <laughs> Episode 10, I think. <laughs> we, we, at, ha- we have at talked about it. time marker, someone, someone 2345. Someone else can figure it out. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my dad weighed in on the on the speckled trend because i i actually remembered this after he he posted a comment about it he used to uh mold for a company called liquid logic and they they did these 
one color like really nice kayaks and a lot of the other kayaks out there had sort of this speckled look um i think perception kayaks is one mm. of the the other big ones um and so what he said about uh, speckling in the kayak world is that the speckle trend in the kayak world came as a solution to the problem of contamination of raw material it was difficult to mit- to mold a solid colored boat without burnt pieces of plastic falling in the mold to cover these blemishes kayak producers started throwing a small cup of black plastic in with the colored plastic what? resulting in speckled kayaks huh. that's i thought that was really interesting yeah it's it's like a cover up of a, a flaw. Right. Well, if you know anything about roto molding, it is the way that the way that the molds are, you have these huge molds that that you open up manually for the most part. There's not a lot of automation in rotational molding. Okay. And so the molds are just kind of laying open and you dump the raw material in. Just by hand. Yeah, by hand. And so it's really easy for for those for those molds for, for other pieces of material to fall in. Oh. And so to get and and if you get blemishes on something that's supposed to be solid color, it's essentially a reject, you know, and you, you have to like churn up that material or you you know, I right. don't know, sell it right, right, right. at a reduced cost. Huh. Um but yeah, so that's it's pretty interesting that, that you know, that trend in the kayak world. Let me see. I think it's Perception Kayaks. Also, I did, I did want to shout out, uh, we got some new mugs on the podcast if you're watching the YouTube. Oh, yeah. Some speckled mugs by Blue Foam, the Instagram meme account. The, the meme king. Um, yeah, so a lot of these kayaks are, are sort of, uh, they're like gradients, but you do have oh, okay. a lot of colors going on in here. So, yeah, so James has pulled up a kayak by Perception, and it is, yeah, it's like, orange to yellow kind of like a mixture of colors so in this case you can have have a blemish or something fall into the mold and it go completely undetected because of everything that's going on with the uh the cmf Hmm. of these kayaks yeah that that's a that's a a cool comment and i yeah i mean this is this is where the Discord's at. I mean, yeah. your dad wasn't on Discord, but like this is the kind of stuff that we talk right. about on Discord too. I so. was, yeah, I was messaging with my dad, and um, you know, I I I said to him, I was like, you know, cool comments on the YouTube, and right. he said, I want to become as famous as Nick's mom. <laughs> when is the uh, minor details parents episode coming? <laughs> That's the real question. Yeah, let's let's get them on here. Um, I I guess another another weekly update is uh, an unfortunate one. And I, I kind of want to talk about this because it, it's like, it's a thing that is a hard part about design, but no one really talks about it at all. Mm. Um, so I've been doing some almost object products, which is my design brand, my personal design brand that I'm working on. Right. Um, and I've gone through like two rounds of sampling on this aluminum product. And, you know, it's just a simple CNC turned piece of aluminum. And, uh, you know, it's been like three months or so of like getting samples, reviewing samples, figuring out how this all, all this stuff works, you know, trying to prepare spec documents and things like that. Um, you know, it's a whole other half of design that we don't really talk about. We actually did do a episode of the other half of design. I don't know. Episode 10 again. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but I got an email. I sent some, uh, some, some, uh, feedback to my supplier, uh, and I got an email back and they said, uh, hello. I should read it. Should I read oh, it? Oh yeah, you should read it. You should send it to me. Can you airdrop it to me oh, so man. I can so I can get it so all all the people in the land can see. Yeah, we gotta we gotta find it now. Um, but uh, yeah, my my supplier emailed me and uh, uh, to preface this, I had some very like critical feedback. Like I Nick had... is demanding. <laughs> yeah, you know, like he expects perfection. <laughs> I I had like um... no dust in the molds. Yeah, I, I there was a few scratches on it. There was a few things that like I wanted to fix. Uh, you know, specifically I wanted to like change some of the dimensions and things. Um but my uh supplier uh I don't know if I can send these to you right now, James, but um my supplier said uh here here's the email. You ready? <laughs> Hi Nick, how was your holiday? I hope you had a nice holiday. Oh wait, no, that's the wrong email. Oh, come on. Hang on a second, hang on a second. 
All right. Hi, Nick. Thanks for your feedback for the samples. For the scratches, it cannot able to avoid because it need to do the anodize. The scratches are the hanging point, which is actually interesting to know. So they hang, they hang uh, machined parts to anodize them, right? They dip, mm. the, dip them in the anodizing bath. Right. So that's good to know. I don't have any hanging points on my product. Um, but, and then they said this, this part. Your product requirements are too high. Our manager told me that we cannot make it perfect. So this time, I do not send you quotation. Sorry for this. Thanks for understanding. Have a nice day. So does that mean that they've dropped you? Yeah, that means that they don't want me to email you back. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard because, you know, I spent like three months working on this project. And now they're like, yeah, you're too hard to work with. So, oh, man. I'm sorry, Nick. It's okay. Did you eat a like a... A tub of ice cream that night. Did you? Um, did you cry? I should eat a tub of ice cream right now. <laughs> Let's do it live. Um, but yeah, you know it's okay. I'm gonna go back to the drawing board. I'm keep keep moving along, and this is just part of the design design world. You know, it's yeah. what you do. You'll you'll find someone better. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of factories in the sea, Nick. Yep. Um, but yes, uh, that was that was my week. We've been just chilling out, working. Yeah. Um, and uh, James wants to talk about something. <laughs> it's, it's design it's news. Design news time. Yeah. The uh, Samsung just launched the Galaxy S10, and they have figured out the ultimate solution for the front-facing camera, in my opinion. <sighs> It's the hole punch. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Samsung launched a new phone. Eat that apple. Their, their flagship phone. And it has a... a uh, so, for those of you who, who are, like, living under a rock, or my mom. My mom doesn't live under a rock, but I don't <laughs> or, think she knows about <laughs> No, I, I heard that as, or living under my mom. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I need some commas in there or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, James hates the iPhone notch on the Ugh, iPhone 10. It's the worst. Um, and you know it 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 is horrid. I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the notch is a horrid trend. Um, and there's been a lot of solutions around solving the notch problem. But uh, I guess Samsung is is doing their part in doing a hole punch in the upper right corner of where the camera will go. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I don't know. How do you feel about it, James? I feel great about it, Nick. And let me tell you why. Uh, I think everybody knows my general criticism of the notch in that it feels like the hardware invading the software yeah. in a way that I think is just horrible. I, I think, you know, there's always this talk of at Apple blending the hardware with the software and there's there's no worse intrusion and more awareness of the where the software ends and the hardware begins than with the notch however with the hole punch i feel like it just feels like something that's part of the interface it it almost feels like you know all of that information up there that's right. always like, up there like the battery and the uh lte service bars and yeah it just is like oh yeah you got the battery and you got the camera you got you got all these other things yeah i like it it just it lines up all in a row and I think I think it's nice. I, I I agree. I think it is a it is a solution. It is a nicer solution than the notch. I would really like to see a company put the camera and all the sensors right up in between where the screen and the bezel meet, kind of like in that crack. A in that nano, crevice. like a nano camera. Yeah, nano camera. <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, it's either that or under the screen. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Under the screen is is. The way to go. Yeah, see, I'm being a little more realistic there. I don't think we can get on the screen in a while. I but, think I mean, one day, one day we'll get there. Right? I I think at, they're they're standing around at Apple right now, just like, you know, we've had we've been sitting on this for years. When are we going to launch it? They're having another party, another brainstorm. Yeah, you yeah. know, they they know what's up. Um, well, we wanted uh, speaking of Apple, uh, we were ta- we were reading in the Discord. Uh, about kind of the topic this week. And we thought it'd be interesting to talk about um, when to go with your intuition and when to trust the research. Mm. 
and I forget the actual comment, but there was like something on the Discord. Someone had mentioned something about like, you know, what should what, I pull it up? You could find it if you want. Um, you know, I, I I think the gist of it was at Apple they just play around and try to invent things, and instead of like sitting and saying like, hey, let's go research, you know, a hundred people and see what they say about the new product. Um, yeah. Did you find it or not? So it's a uh, beanie design. And uh, so they say, so a question on my mind that I've had for a while is that Johnny Ive said recently at Cambridge Hawkins award thing that I, that when the design, they don't look for, uh, that when they design, they don't look for problems. Instead, Apple's design team just explores ideas they they just have furthermore if you look historically at the greatest innovations no one seems to start from a problem instead they use their intuition and explore ideas they have so why should we trust ideo and the like when they say that design followers uh they say that design follows this linear process from problem through solution would love to get people's thoughts yeah Um, shout out to beanie design for uh adding to the conversation there yes um, but yeah, I, I think there's definitely, definitely some thoughts around this. I mean, I, I even think about some of the big innovations of like, uh, you know, like the phone, the telephone, right? That was an accident, right? Yeah. Weren't they like, they were playing around with some sort of, uh, you know, em, em radio emissions and like the guy yelled from upstairs cause they like tripped or fall. I, I can't remember the story, but like, you know, the story is, is like, it was an accident. Right. Same with the microwave. The guy had left a chocolate bar in his pocket and was like playing around with radio waves. Right. And a lot of these big innovations are sometimes accidents. It's not like people going out and being like, all right guys, let's search for a problem and solve it. You know, right. which is a lot of, I, I feel like a lot of times that's a prominent thing that's taught in design school is you must start with the problem. Hmm. Yeah, I can remember in design school, they would always hound us for coming into product projects with preconceived notions. That was that was one that was one thing. So Mm. it was all all about. And I think that there's some validity to that, because especially when you're young and in design school, you can have some sort of I mean, throughout your entire life, you might have some naive thoughts around a certain subject that you're designing for. I think with a, with some of these inventors, though, you're looking at people that are truly just exploring curiosities. Right. Like they're, they're just like compelled by their curiosity. And, and to be clear, like designing and inventors are separate people. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think sometimes um, designers like the, I, I don't know that we're always so innovative, but we're, but it, I don't know. We're, we're trying to, take the world of innovation and make it palatable yeah sometimes Mm -hmm. um because uh, you know we talked about this in the Derek casio episode like designers aren't necessarily coming up with all this amazing technology we're just packaging it in such a way that the general public can benefit from it right right um so yeah i i don't know it's um i don't know what do you think nick well i i think you made an interesting point there talking about like how you reframe the problem when you're in school like Mm. you said something like you had Uh, to like get rid of all preconceived preconceived notions notions. which you know for for me i remember going to school and that was like an interesting another interesting thing was like you know instead of thinking of like or i i would i you know i don't know all the professors are different but you know my professors were definitely on the side of like hey we're not designing a toaster Mm. no we're designing a bread uh, warming oh, device, right? right? Like always breaking down what that actual thing is into a very like a, a, as like non I don't know descriptive as as it could be. Like right, you know how do you break that down into its like simplest form? Yes, because with a toaster and here comes the pun. There's a lot of baked in. <laughs> Notions. We gotta stop the podcast. Yeah. We gotta restart. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, there, there's, there, you immediately like, there's an image that comes to mind of the toaster when somebody says, "Right, we need, we're gonna design a toaster." 
Yeah. And so it's very hard, especially early on, to break out of that. Yeah, and a bread warming device could be an open bonfire. Yeah. And a stick. Right. And yeah, and it's it's wide open. Like I don't know. Like when when you re reframe the problem in that way, it's it's very different. Right. I always think about also the famous analogy of the elevator. Have you heard this one? No. Uh, you know, it's a pretty common analogy, but it was, you know, there there's a big building, a tall building in New York City, right? Mm-hmm. We we've been to a lot of tall buildings in New York City, and <laughs> and uh, not together. Well, some of them together, but, um, you know, it's like, oh, all these people are upset because the elevator is so slow. Okay. Mm. Well, the elevator's slow. What can we do to fix that? And so you give it to like a bunch of engineers and they're like, okay, well, what if we make the, the motor faster? Oh, I know we can make the pulley system different because if the pulley has a, a smaller wheel at the top, then it'll have this better torque. And like, you know, they start ranting off on like how to make this elevator faster. Right. But you need to step back from that because that's not the real problem. Mm. The elevator speed is not the problem. The problem is that people are impatient. Are impatient, hmm. and so when you reframe the problem, when you break it down to its very like distilled essence, then you come up with different solutions. You're thinking, well, if people are impatient. Let's just put like a mirror in the elevator so people can like primp themselves while they're, while they're going up the elevator is this are you about to tell me the story of how elevator music got invented uh, that that could be very well a, a solution to the problem yeah i always think a good solution to that problem would be placing where's waldo posters across the elevator <laughs> <laughs> or i spy you remember i spy books do you remember those books or no? no maybe that was a different generation but oh wait 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 no i absolutely remember okay, i spy yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a, it was, I Spy was I like. I love those books. Yeah, those were a. Oh, man. A, a essentially amazing photography of a bunch of random items. And they would be like all these little scenes, maquettes. You can see it if you're watching the YouTube right now. But yeah. it's like, you know, like a bunch of just like tchotchke stuff put into one scene and the amazing photography done. Oh, those. And then it also had like little prompts at the bottom of the book. It was like, hey, find the find the action figure doing a cartwheel, you know? So good. Such a good such good books. I remember just like looking at them for hours. Yeah. Um but uh but yeah, you know actually the uh the f- the Freedom Tower. Yes. Um have you have you been up? Yeah. You, you were up there recently. Yeah, right? with, my, with, with folks. my family for Christmas. Did you notice what happened in the elevator? It was amazing. As you were going up. Yeah. I wonder if that is that online? I'm sure it anywhere? is. I'm sure it is. But but yeah, I mean to describe it, you know, this is the tallest building in the US, you know, the the One World Trade Center in New York City. Oh yeah. And it starts out, you know, you get into this elevator, you're on the first floor, it starts out in the bedrock and you're going up. And and to be clear, the elevator is a full like TV screen. Oh right? yeah. It's so, like all the walls are TV screens. And as you go up, you know, you're kind of like boosted into this, you know, it, I guess CGI sky. And, you know, you have these forest and greenery around you. And then as you go up, the years start counting up. Yeah. So you start off, like, in the 1800s, like, when New York was first founded. And, you know, you start to see these, like, cottages and villages build up. And then slowly, as you get higher and higher to the different floors, the the years increase. And you're in the 1900s, and you start seeing taller buildings. And eventually, you start seeing the Empire State Building across your across your view. And, uh, and yeah, we're watching it right now on the YouTube. Oh. But you can... You know, you get, pretty, to the, you get to the top floor and it's like, oh, wait, now you're in present day, 2019. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It, like, I was not expecting it and it was definitely a great way to uh, occupy the time. Although that elevator was pretty quick. Yeah, you, you, I mean, it was like, it, it was super quick. It's like, wait, I want to stay in yeah. here longer, you know? Yeah. And at the very end, when you get back in the elevator, complete free fall. No, it's not free fall. It's not like, it's not an amusement park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gosh. um but uh but we we kind of sidetracked yeah but the the elevator analogy um that was about like knowing the right problem to solve or or right. or a problem like understanding the different problems that you could solve yeah and i think that's a big part of the the whole like you know what what is the part you should research or what what part is like i don't know what she should have emotion about or just kind of intuition about yeah yeah i mean i think going back to the original the original topic of like 
you know, when do you use your intuition and when do you need to trust the research? Right. Cause that's a, that's a tough question because I think a lot of times, and I think we've talked about this too, but like research is held up as this like, like golden rule, like right. always follow research. If yeah. the consumers want this thing, the consumers say the screen should be bigger. Well, we must make the screen bigger. Right. And to some extent, like the research is very valuable. But when do you know, like, when do you break the research and when do you go with your intuition? It's a hard question. To it's answer. really difficult. I think, I think you're more aware of when to break with it when you have, when you have good experience with whatever you're designing. I mean, I feel like f f to some degree, I can design like home goods with a, a good deal of certainty around my intuition because I've, I've lived, it's like designing things for the home or designing things for the office. It's like, you're kind of, you're immersed in these environments mm, every day. That's true. And like if you're designing a wheelchair, I mean, obviously we need to do a ton of research. On right. That. So I think, cause, cause to me, intuition is just like it, it's not, conscious research but it's years and years of kind of your own personal living research yeah you know that's because true. the other thing is is that my design intuitions were terrible when i got into school <laughs> they were awful but you know through education and through that whole process which was almost you know like a research pro process in its own like going through all of that then all of that becomes intuition. Yeah. Like that, that then, you know, um, I, I, so. I think, I think that is an, a key part of this conversation is like, you know, intuition is this something is, is this thing that you kind of gain over time. It's not something you can really learn or like, you, you know, like it's not like you can go online and watch an hour long YouTube video and be like, Oh yes, I got more intuition. Right. It's, it's this slow evolution of, understanding what the best solution should be even though you don't quite know it's it's not that you don't know it's that you just have this feeling because of all your past experiences that yeah. this is the right direction because because when you start getting down into the very like nitty-gritty design stuff the uh minor details uh, oh <laughs> all right that's my bad joke for that stuff um <laughs> you know it's like i have internal bleeding right now it's, it's like do you make this fill it on this you know toaster 10 millimeters or five millimeters mm. and you look at them side by side and there's no research to tell you which way to go. Right. No, there is only intuition. And, and at that point it's like, well, in your past experience of like feeling fillets and curves and like understanding how things look, how things play in the light, all those things kind of are in your subconscious and you look at that five millimeter and that 10 millimeter and you just know. You know that it's 10 millimeters or that it's 5 millimeters. It's always 10 millimeters, everybody. <laughs> that's just the default. We have found the answer. I mean, that's the default that SolidWorks goes it's to. It's no longer <laughs> intuition. It is 100% fact. Put 10 millimeter radiuses on everything. Even the iPhone. Yeah. That would not look right. The next <laughs> SolidWorks 2019, the fillet button will just be 10 millimeter fillets. That's only, only fillets the you can only, do. Yeah, that's the only thing you need. We've done it, everybody. We've um, accomplished the ultimate fillet. Um, but... Uh, I, I also like the... Uh, I also like to bring up the, the... What was it? Henry Ford phrase again. The, if you ask people what they want, they would ask for a, ha a faster horse. Right. But yeah. I don't know. I just like that quote a lot because it's like, yeah, I mean... I might be experimenting or doing some crazy thing. I mean, I even got a comment. Um, I've been playing around with some tray concepts on the Instagram. And I even got a comment of like, someone messaged me and says like, hey, do people need a, another tray? And I'm like, no. They and you're like, block? <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't block them. I didn't block them. I said, I said, no, they need better trays, right? Like, oh, yeah. Like what's the evolution of a tray? Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think, um, oh gosh, I was going to make a point about the, like what you were talking about when it comes to those like minor, those minor details. Oh gosh, I always, 
I'm losing my train of the thought fi- the more five, and more the often. Fi- the five millimeters and the ten millimeters. Yeah, but um, like, how, like, do you have any? When you look at a, an entire wall of concepts, because this is a question that we've also got, I think as well. You know, it's like, you know, you see a wall of concepts. Which one do you pick? Mm-hmm. Like, let's say they're all like equally feasible. Like, they're all, you know, are functional. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the the functionality, and they're just aesthetic variations. Which one do you choose? And and I think this is the key part that a lot of designers miss, especially young designers. Is like, I, I see this a lot on you know the internet, Instagram, things like that. It's like people are sketching up concepts. They're making a lot of great, you know, concept sketches, and like they look, might look pretty. They might they might you know work well, but they're missing those intuition moments of like. Mm. Oh, this concept is correct because, you know, that ten millimeter form really plays well with the other, the the button in the side, and like right. er, er, the whole composition and the form of it all balances out. Yeah, and it's always interesting. I like, I do like the critique with multiple designers because there are things that come up that you as an individual might never consider, and there are these there are these moments where people with vastly different life experiences, vastly different intuitions, perhaps, you know, they'll, and and it starts kind of like the best kind of moment is when there's, there's like true discourse about like, like half of the people are on one side, half of the people are on the other side. Oh, that's always tough. Man. Oh, I love it. And then you, and then you both agree on a on a combination of oh, both. Oh yeah, the and com- then it com- the old, comes out as a disaster. The old compromise. <laughs> the old, the old camel. Uh, the thing that I was going to say earlier, and this this plays into that as well, is is um, sometimes you feel like has this ever happened to you where you feel like you arrived at the solution early on and then you were asked to do more variations even though you feel like i think this is it yeah and then you end up coming back to that in the long run like at the end of the process yeah i've I've heard both sides of that story i've heard the the side of the story of like the first 10 sketches you do are just trash like Mm -hmm. always do you know like uh, a thousand con- oh, not a thousand but you know do a ton of concepts because the first few you do are going to be the very first like trash ideas right um but then i've also heard the other thing of like the first few you do are like the very the most like intuitive and, mm. and like the most like oh clicked it clicked right. right then and there like i know what it is right and then you still keep exploring well that's something that we talked about with kelly custer of knack is like she you know, she, the, with the hanger project, she, she like sketched out the hanger and then she was like, I need to do like 50 more concepts and then just came back to the hanger. And there is this feeling of, oh God, like I really need to prove to myself that this is the right solution. And then, but, but you yeah. know, it's, it's like you are, you have developed all this intuition over your career. Right. Like maybe your first inclination is right. I, I think there's a, there's something to say in terms of concept or like idea. Mm-hmm. Like you can have, like the first idea that comes to you can be the idea. Yeah. Like a hanger on a street sign, which is what she designed so that you can put clothes, uh, like, you know, clothes for the homeless on it. Like yeah. That is a core idea. And that might have been her first idea. And that's a great idea. Yeah. And now like the variations of form, like she can play with forever. Right. You know, like I think about some of my past projects. I think about like the birdhouse. Mm-hmm. That one was a pretty much like, oh, what if I put a birdhouse on a on a telephone pole, and I make it so that it looks like a flyer, like mm, you know, yeah, a yeah. piece of flyer. And yeah. and that in itself is already a fully formed, you know, design. Like, there's really not much to play around with in terms of aesthetic details. It's like, how do I convey the idea in the simplest way possible? I mean that that's kind of more more my personal philosophy of like just coming up with the con the core concept and then trying to translate that as cleanly as possible to the finished product. Right. The um there there's another idea that's in um I think it's in like lean manufacturing six sigma stuff and it's what is that? It, it's called the five whys. Is that a book? I 
lean manufacturing lean manufacturing no it's it's uh it's like the toyota have you ever heard of the toyota like manufacturing system it's basically like from what i understand of it and i'm probably going to botch this but it's it's just like a method of setting up a manufacturing facility so that um there's like you're kind of removing waste from from like okay if if this person in in the process has to grab this tool then where does that tool go uh right right. it's just like pure optimization yeah Yeah, yeah. stuff like that okay um but the five whys they say that it takes five whys to get to the core like to the root of a problem Hmm. and so if if you keep asking why and and I've heard this. I heard this story a while ago. I think it was actually from my dad. And I'm probably going to botch this as well. But there. But I think it was. I don't know. Maybe five, six years ago. Um, they were, um, like Congress was deciding on like there was this problem where a lot of birds were pooping on the Lincoln statue. Okay, interesting. And so and so they were coming up with a budget to figure out like okay we need to like. You know, we need to clean this every so often. We might need to like, to, is it painted? I don't know if they have to repaint it. I think it's just marble, right? Um, yeah, I think. But anyway, they were they were coming up with this cleaning regimen, and like it was going to cost like a pretty good amount of money, right? And and so, one con, I think it was a congressman who knew the five whys. He just kept asking why. He kept asking why, and what what ended up happening was. The reason that there were birds in there pooping on the statue is because the the lights going on in the Lincoln Memorial were attracting moths, oh. and, and the birds were coming in to eat the moths and then pooping on the statue. That's crazy. And I think what they ended up doing was like delaying Just when, put the, moth balls. when the lights came on or something so that it wouldn't... I, I, I don't remember the solution quite, but, it, but basically like they found what the core root of the problem was um so yeah that's like another way it's it's another like bit of research where you can uh yeah the five ways i like that yeah that's a good one but um i don't know i do think that the most interesting designs do seem to come out of curiosities and and sort of intuitions when designers are acting more like artists yeah um than scientists but i also see a tremendous amount of value in just like the optimization of design when it comes to the process yeah i i definitely think it's very product dependent like we were saying like yeah you know designing a new chair like something crazy like maybe that is just intuition uh you know just make up crazy idea yeah versus you know a medical device like oh yeah research all the way right you know right but no, I think that was a, that was definitely interesting thoughts. I don't know. Um, yeah, but we would love to hear your thoughts as well. Let us know. Discord. So yeah, email, Discord, voicemail. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Get, the, get that voicemail. Um, and, and speaking of voicemails, should we uh, should we listen to voice, some voicemails? Yes, we should. Okay. Um, we didn't. Well, we got one in this week from my dad, and then we also had one last week, <laughs> which is another good comment. But here, I'm going to play my dad's one. Oh, actually, before we play this, our voicemail, if you guys want to send in a voicemail, is 1-646-494-4011. Yes. And it's just a Google voice number, so we won't answer the phone. Um, So just leave a voicemail. Okay, here's my dad. Good morning, gentlemen. I am listening to the Monday podcast, and I just wanted to compliment James on his perfect rendition of the Apple brainstorming party. I had (laughs) no idea this is how it works. I think it's great, guys. Keep up the good work. Have a great day. Actually, make it a great day. Yeah. Um, I want to announce to, to everybody that I'm actually going to be doing an off-Broadway play um, <laughs> called the Apple Brainstorm Party. Go back and listen to the last episode if you didn't, because it was pretty funny. <laughs> James's, uh, James's like rendition of coming up with the iPod. Yeah. Intoxicated designers are amazing innovators. All right, so we do we do have a, a real voicemail here from I believe it was B Thumb Design who left this voicemail again, um, but this is another comment that they had. So let's play this one. Hey there, James and Nick, uh, fellas. I was listening to your latest podcast, and I was thinking to myself, 
um, these philosophies you're coming up with. Uh, there were people who were commenting, responding to familiarism in particular, and saying things like, you were not an authority on the subject. Um, I just had a, a question about that. I was wondering if uh, designers can't come up with philosophies and uh, create their own design, uh, I guess design philosophies that they base their design processes around, then uh, whose job is it to determine that? And at what point do you have enough authority uh, in your in your design journey uh, to establish that for yourself? Um, that's not to say that you're naming something that's already been happening, um, but just to create your own philosophy. Uh, so who who's playing these cards and uh, why doesn't yours count? Anyways, just a thought. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Um yeah, and if you guys missed that episode, uh, it was, I don't know, two episodes ago where James and I talked about our design philosophies. I talked about this kind of thing I, I coined called familiarism, which is taking a familiar interaction and adding it to an incongruous product, you know, a product that would never have this interaction, mm-hmm. to create like this really unique and new uh, design. Um, and, you know, I got a little flack for it. But, you know, I, I, I believe B Thumbs design or b thumb design question was you know some of my critique was i don't have a doctorate in des- in design theory mm. um but do i need a doctorate like who who gets to create design theories yeah you know who gets to create these philosophies yeah i i don't i don't think that there's any sort of permission needed or or like yeah, I mean, I'm are pre- they expecting? I'm pretty, sh- I'm pretty sure you have to go ask Dieter Rams. Yeah, can I have permission? I think people are thinking you you have to talk to Don Norman, um, who who authored uh, Design of Everyday Objects. Right. You know, he has he has a lot of books uh, around sort of design theory, and I don't know. My feeling is is that if people, if if you express a philosophy and people pick it up and it becomes functional for them and then proliferates through time, then that's a functional philosophy. But if you put your philosophy out there and nobody's digging it and nobody picks it up, then it's not a functional philosophy. I mean, that I think it's kind of as simple as that. I I agree. I think there is there is like some sort of like very simplistic way of thinking about it in that terms but i think there's another way of thinking about it in in the terms of like true a true philosophy not not related to design but like true theory and true philosophy of you know like scientific theory and like things that have been proven out proven out over and over and over again and documented through tons of research studies you know and those those things become full-fledged theories and philosophies and they're very much you know institutionalized Mm -hmm. i don't i I design certainly has some of that but i i feel like design is much less institutionalized in that way um compared to you know like you know psychology or you know astrology or any of the Mm -hmm. astrology no astronomy astronomy (laughs) astrology is the sign what's your sign no okay no no. let's look look up horoscopes (laughs) um but uh and that's something I've also talked to my friend Sean Davison about of like my friend Sean Davison is into architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, and he talks, of, he, he's been talking to me about like, you know, architecture has a lot more theory put into it. Mm. There's a lot more theory around architecture and more, it's more institutionalized in that way mm-hmm. as compared to industrial design. Hmm. Um, and that's a whole nother conversation. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know who has the authority to just make up, design philosophies and honestly like i you know i you know i i pronounce like familiarism as a philosophy but if you want to use another word of like practice or you know idea in terms in 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 example of philosophy then i think that's fine too like i i think maybe the whole philosophy definition just trips people up you know yeah because i because from my understanding i didn't think that a philosophy or was was something and i just looked up the definition a the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge reality and existence especially when considered as an academic discipline but 
my my feeling about philosophy, I didn't think that a philosophy necessarily needed to go through the scientific rigor that a theory had to go through. Oh, uh, maybe you're right. So I think I think there's a difference there. Okay. Because because a theory absolutely like you know it's something that's proven out and then it becomes a law, right? <laughs> We're if I'm into, if I'm remembering we're this into, correctly, we're getting into but different, I don't, different grounds. I don't think here. we that, are not qualified to talk about this. Stuff. I don't think that philosophies necessarily have to be proven. Yeah, um, this, this is another thing I was thinking as well along this comment is, in and as well when I was reading through all this critique of of my familiarism idea, people were mentioning like, you know, like you don't have the master's degree in in design theory and and whatnot. And I was like, you know, it's interesting, and this is a whole other conversation as well, but like the whole idea of, you know, these large institutions and colleges is starting to like waver mm. and, you know, the, you know, who knows what the design education of the future is going to look like. Right. Will there be these big design schools that you have to go to to become a designer? Who knows? Or really any schools. Uh, I mean, there's going to be certainly some schools, but different trades are different. Uh, you know, you learn different, I mean we probably need medical school, medical school right yeah study. but it, you know if if design school ever goes goes away and it's some sort of like apprenticeship program or mm. online education like who says who's a good designer anymore mm. like if you don't have a degree in industrial design does that make you an industrial designer i don't know i don't know well I, you don't you don't need a degree to be industrial designer no but i I would say in defense of design education in its in its current form that it's probably one of the more practical degrees, you know, of all of the degrees that you encounter. Like you certainly don't need a business degree to go into business. And like the amount of exposure that we have to doing more hands-on project-based real world type scenarios within design school i think it's like a pretty good bang for your buck for sure yeah i i yeah but no i i I agree that i think that there's going to be some morphing going on in the future yeah uh in the future but yeah don't quit design school right now (laughs) i know that you said that because like we have students listening and they're like oh should i quit but no i I definitely agree with james and the fact that like design school still is very core into becoming to becoming a ses- successful designer. Um, I just think it's like... But who knows what in, the future's going to In hold. terms of a way of spending your college years, like, wouldn't you rather be getting real hard skills? Because even if you don't end up in industrial design, you could end up in carpentry or illustration yeah, or, yeah. So, you know, there's like... And and there's like this sense of... of uh, like what's imbued in somebody that goes through a design school that I don't think a lot of other majors appreciate is the is the process of going from like zero to or from soup to nuts. It, it, I've always thought about this too, and this is so interesting because I think about other majors, maybe I don't know English or something. I don't know yeah. like if you got like a math degree or you know some some more liberal arts degree, and not to put those down, but it's just like. You know, it, it what happens when maybe there's no English jobs left, mm-hmm. right? Like, as a designer, what happens if there's no industrial design jobs? Well, I don't know. I, I've been taught how to solve problems. I've been taught how to take nothing and create something. It's right. like, I don't know, the, the ability to just create something from your mind is very powerful. Yeah. Don't discount the mathematicians. They're very rigorous. <laughs> yes, I don't. I'm not saying that. The, I'm not saying that those uh, those degrees are bad. I'm just. Say, I was just like. Yeah. C- continuing on your point. No, I, I I agree because I because you know when it comes to like kind of the business school example, I I don't know how much of that education in un, in the undergraduate degree is really like taking taking things to to a level of execution. Right. That you see in the real world. Yeah, because designers just do stuff. They just yeah. do it. Yeah. And I think that, like like I said, if you don't end up in the design field, like at least you have that in you, that understanding of like, 
what you need to do to 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 make something to right. you know anyway all right i think we got a little sidetracked there but this is that's okay you know that's I, that's what this podcast is all about exactly Nick. exactly no I'm, I'm green with you um uh but yes thanks for sending it into our voicemail if you guys have voicemail uh or comments questions anything really send to our voicemail uh 646-494-4011 um and then we got some email questions Mm. as well mm-hmm. Meyer details podcast at gmail.com um and our first question comes from kevin i don't know if you want to read this one kevin claridge asks uh as technology becomes smarter and smaller becoming nearly or literally invisible in regards to the physical objects that have dominated industrial design for so long How will our jobs as industrial designers change as we move into the future? For example, I imagine a future for us in which you no longer need a physical watch. You will simply see an augmented augmented reality in which whatever watch you chose for the day is on your wrist. How will the role as industrial designers be affected when a majority of our reality is digital instead of physical? Okay, well, first of all, Kevin... We're not going to be looking at our wrist to read the time if we're in augmented reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be a heads-up display, right? Oh man, have I told you? Have I told you my idea about? I I apologize if if I've said this already on the podcast. I have this idea that instead of clothing, we'll just wear these like nude suits, <laughs> and when we have the augmented reality glasses. And you just you just pick the outfit you want for the day, and, and it's just pro- projected on you for everybody to see. We're all walking around in these with these nude suits on. All right, how much you want for investing, James? I'm I'm investing in your company. <laughs> this is the new uh, company. cool mill. A cool be, mill. All yeah, right. I'll send that your way. Um, but yeah, we were actually having a conversation about this. This was it this week. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, as you guys because know, you were, sorry, because you were talking about the chair in your vr home right yes as you guys know i am uh living in vr most of my life i come out for this podcast and this podcast alone (laughs) Um, and uh you know uh recently uh oculus i use the oculus rift and they have this vr house which is kind of like your main screen um you know you can access all your things here but you can also decorate your house put different furniture pieces in it and things like that and you know they're constantly updating adding new pieces of furniture and decor and recently they added this like nice design chair and I was like, oh, this is a cool chair. But it's not a real chair. It's a virtual chair. And right. it's definitely not been, t- well, I, I don't say, I don't know, definitely, but I'm pretty sure it's not, it wasn't designed by an industrial designer. I'm sure it was a game designer or like a game developer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting to think about um, in terms of like where the future's headed because if we all live in a virtual world are we gonna or industrial designers gonna start designing virtual objects yeah it's really interesting because imagine like imagine that everybody just gets the same like base bed like base sofa whatever it's just like this basic whatever and then you put on your augmented reality and you can literally design anything and it's always going to be comfortable. And and well <laughs> and going off of that like the, and then what does what does design cost? Like if design is free, yeah. Like if it's free to have like a really high-end Herman Miller whatever it is, you know, chair, I mean, and, and compared to IKEA, like mm. I don't know, what does that mean? Like do you have to pay for the high-end design if oh, it's man. the exact same thing, it's just pixels? I mean, don't people buy things digitally and some things are more expensive than others? I mean, I think maybe, you can I artificially so. inflate the price. Uh, that's true. Right? Because everybody's always going to want to like flaunt their wealth. But then you can just pirate chairs. I, I mean, know. you can just illegally download a chair. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't illegally download a car, would you? <laughs> yeah, I would actually. Now that you're <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys remember that commercial? That, that commercial in front of the movies? You know, it's like, you know, you, got, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, right. You know, in, in like the old days, or I don't know how old this old days it was, but you no, know, there was this like anti-piracy commercial that would say, you wouldn't steal a house. You oh, wouldn't steal a car. Oh, right. So don't steal a movie. You right. Because pirating is illegal. Yeah. No, I imagine, I imagine people 
But then there would be the sort of like Yeezy Bustas of the digital world being like, that's a fake like Gucci chair. <laughs> You know, they would they would know how to read the pixels and everything and like read the source code and be like, that's fake. The future is going to be crazy. And, you know, it's also interesting. And I think I mentioned this to you earlier this week, but, um, you know, the idea of having a virtual chair, right? Like, you know, I, I'm in my VR house. I have all these virtual pieces of furniture and like, it, it's really nice. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. But it kind of reckons back to the, the old iPhone and how the first when the iphone came out it kind of had this skeuomorphic look of like trying to emulate the real world right into the digital world and right. this is the exact same thing it's like emulating the real world for like my furniture and everything into this virtual world right and so what is the virtual world going to evolve into like if mm. is it going to like become flat ui like the iphone did oh god i hope not that'd be kind of weird that was I was totally on board with that whole idea until I saw the Apple icons that they replaced everything with because I thought that that was some of the worst graphic design. Were you talking about the gradients? I'm I'm talking about Which one like talking when about? they first transitioned over to the flat um to the flat apps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought I thought those app tiles were were horrid. Well, that was that was a whole gradient thing. Remember that we talked about that last week. Was it the gradient thing to start out with? Yeah, iOS. What was it? iOS nine. Was that the one that switched over? I don't know. Let me see. Yeah, because for a while, you know, Apple had the skeuomorphic look, which was like how the the Notepad looked like a, a legal pad, and like the the calculator had the actual like buttons with the highlights and everything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I think it was iOS nine, iOS eight. I don't know, iOS seven. What Let's was? see. Just start searching back. iOS eight. Yep, we got it. We got it, the flat. It was one of the updates. Seven. It was we've one of got, the. <laughs> we've got flat. It was one of the updates where they switched everything over to a very flat UI. What um, about six? You know. Is it six? Oh, here so, we so, still have skeuomorphism. So yeah, iOS seven, I believe, was. Uh, yeah, we pulled it up. iOS seven was the time that they switched over. Um, now I'm not saying that I liked these. Yeah. But I just I felt like I felt that the graphic design could have been so much better. See, everyone always feels that the graphic design that's the whole thing with the rebranding thing, which is going back to the Slack logo. It's yeah. like when people change branding around, people notice and people just hate change inherently. So that's why people dislike it. But yeah. anyways, uh yeah, that was a good question from Kevin. Was there yeah. any other? I mean, my thought is like, you know, I'm kind of speaking like far out in the future of like, oh, you know, what if industrial designers now become virtual industrial designers? Right. We're just designing virtual objects. I think, sorry. What? Nick, go ahead. Oh, no, I had one more comment, which is really another interesting comment. And uh, <laughs> I, it's, I, it's, an, it's an interesting one, everybody. Because, because you know, I, I live in virtual reality all the time. <laughs> Hold just, on to your seats. Um. I am exhibited in this museum, the virtual uh, museum of other realities, which yes. I've discussed on a pretty old podcast. I think um, it's a virtual place, you know, in VR, you go there in VR, but it's, it looks like a real museum. You can walk around this virtual museum and it Is feels like, it? Mm-hmm, it feels like a real museum. Um, and you know, there's a ton of VR artists in there. There's like, you know, people are doing stuff in like tilt brush and, uh, quill which which are like vr painting programs and i was talking to the founder the other day and they are hiring an architect and i'm not oh. i'm not talking about like a software architect i'm not talking about like someone who writes code and creates soft art or, you know architecture in that way i'm talking about a real architect that designs buildings they're hiring an architect to design a virtual building that's awesome which is just like blows my mind for a second like yeah because because think about that architect for a second they don't have to be constrained to any real world constraints they don't have to like put an hvac system in this virtual world right there's yeah it's like what is a building when it's not a, a real building anymore what is a piece of furniture when it's not a real piece of furniture yeah you know what is a virtual coffee cup look like right when you don't have to constrain to liquid yeah 
Okay, sorry. Well, no, I just Nick, started to I mean, blow that no, out. I, I'm just blowing that entire question it's out. A, a it's a whole it's a whole other topic, but it but it is very interesting. The other side of the coin yes. is is that, you know, when we're talking about smaller and all of these things, the thing is is that we are caught in a certain point in our industrial revolution where like we have these flat panels of electronics Speci- that have to be definitely specifically in tech design yes, yes that have to be encased in a certain way and i think that there's gonna come a point where we're gonna see blurred lines between product and ui and not just in sort of an augmented reality sense i think we my feeling is that i'm interested in a world where like things get more of a i don't know organic human touch to them when it comes to these kind of devices that we interact with i remember this concept phone and i don't i don't know that i'll be able to pull it up but it was kind of this like amoeba ish looking smartphone that you could like you could like bend it was made like, out of silly putty there was there was like no it was like a silicone ish thing but you could like you know, when you were in the camera mode, you could flex it to like to zoom in what? or flex it to zoom out. Oh, that's and interesting. This was a concept phone from way back in the day, but hmm. I've o- this is always stuck in my mind of like when when we get out of this world, like when we get to the next phase of like whatever the technological revolution takes us in terms of the hardware, like right. like when we break out of the rounded rectangle, what what is next i don't know that's a really interesting question but anyway um i think that's all the time we have for today i'm I'm starting to spiral down into this like virtual realm right now (laughs) uh but yes yes that's uh he's spiraling where we uh we are uh we want to thank you guys for listening Um, absolutely and of course every week we like to give a shout out of the week and this week we want to shout out liga studio um and their instagram handle is l-i-g-a studio f-r Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I guess they're a London slash Paris studio. Cool. Um, and as you guys know, James is taking a little break from Instagram, so I picked this guy, this these uh these people out, and uh, it's very furniture. It's like a furniture studio, mm-hmm. and they're doing kind of some cool interactions. You know, they they're playing with these rubber bands, using rubber bands as thick boys, some thick boys, two <laughs> two C's, maybe even a third C. Um, <laughs> You know, they're using these rubber bands as an assembly method. And so, like, one of the examples is they have a lamp, which is just, like, you get these two, like, glass tubes. Mm -hmm. One of the tubes has a light in it and a rubber band. So, all you do is you just put the tubes together and you take take your rubber band and you strap your rubber band around it and, bam, you got a lamp. And uh, here's a little disassembled look at what they look like. Right. Um, would you call these fat straps, these bands? No, they're, they're, they're thick bands, not fat straps. <laughs> um, but I will say I, this, you know, you guys can look it up, but I think this embodies the, the idea of familiarism mm. because it's using the familiar interaction of rubber bands. Everyone knows how to use a rubber band and applying it to an incongruous product, like a lamp or like mm. a mirror. And creating this very unique and fun design. Um, so yeah, this is a good good example of that. Cool. Um, but yeah, shout out to you guys. Uh, and um, yeah, as always, our intro and outro, Kiyoshi the Kid. Yep. Subscribe, like, YouTube, podcast. Spotify. Spotify. Uh, tell your friends. Get on that Discord. There's some really cool conversations coming out of that Discord, and definitely. that's what spawned the whole topic for this episode. Definitely. So um, definitely get on there and get in the conversation. Yeah, we'll see we you guys We want to hear what you guys think. This is a conversation. Yeah, and it's it's getting exciting. I love it. Yeah. Um, and as always, I'm at Nick B. Baker. And I'm at I Draw on Receipts. Peace out. Later. <laughs>